Hey everybody, in this video we are going to start talking about gene therapy, therapy at least current advances with respect to gene ther therapy. It's not a, a widely used technique yet, but it is becoming more common. So what is gene therapy? Essentially, let's say a human lacks a functional copy of an essential gene. Now, gene therapy seeks to deliver a functional copy of that gene to many of the human cells. So an example would be, uh, let's say an X-linked disorder called ornithine transcarbamylase uh, deficiency. So there's an X-linked disorder called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, which is caused by a mutation in the ornithine transcarbamylase gene. Now this disease is fatal at birth, um, unless, but 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 I should I should add that there are some cases of this disorder where, say, the trans ornithine transcarbamylase gene is partially functional, and those individuals can survive. Um, there is a person who suffered from this deficiency, deficiency named Jesse Gelsinger. Now, Jesse had a form of the disorder uh, that was not as severe as the fatal form because Jesse was what we would call a somatic uh, mosaic for the mutant gene. And what this means, if you remember from our previous video, where we were talking, previous meaning like the last video, that uh, I think number 2403 it was. So if we have a zygote here, and the first cell division is called cleavage, right? And so we have two cells, which are inside this zona pellucida, now let's say this is an XY zygote, one X chromosome, one Y chromosome. So every cell has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And after this division here, after this mitosis, we have an X and a Y over here and an X and a Y over here. Well, what if this X right here all, you know, is mutated, develops a mutation in the gene for ornithine transcarbamylase? Well, every cell that results from division of this cell, you know, every daughter cell from this, every ancestral, not ancestral, but descendant of this cell would have a mutation in that ornithine transcarbamylase gene. But every cell that comes from this one would not. So this is an example of somatic mosaicism, where you have a mutation very early on during embryogenesis. So part of the cells of the individual have a mutation while other cells do not have that mutation. So Jesse Gelsinger was a somatic mosaic for this X-linked disorder here. So some of his cells lacked this, this gene. So he was able to live a normal life um, just surviving on uh, a modified diet because I guess the ability to break down ammonia resulting from uh, protein metabolism is one of the things that, that causes the fatality associated with this disorder. So Jesse survived on a modified diet and special medications, but he was also very interested in contributing to you know therapies that could help cure this, these individuals who are, are who die essentially at birth because they, they lack a functional copy of this gene. So he wants to help 
these individuals who, who cannot survive, who have the most severe form of the disease. So Jesse enrolled in a gene therapy trial. So even though he was mostly okay, you know, can leave, live a normal life, he volunteers for the gene therapy trial to help, help find a cure for, for those who have the severe form of the disorder. But unfortunately, you know, so after, and so how did this trial work? So I gave it away, unfortunately. Um, essentially, uh, this was in 1999. So doctors and researchers had injected a modified, what we're going to call adenovirus. So the modified adenovirus lacked the genes necessary to cause infection. And in the place of those genes, the adenovirus had a copy of ornithine transcarbamylase. And the idea was the adenovirus would deliver this gene to most of or a good number of Jesse's cells. So unfortunately, very tragic, the, the high levels of this adenovirus triggered a massive immune response in Jesse, uh, which led to a failure of a number of his organs and he died after about four days. So, so this is in 1999 and you know, with, a, with such a tragic um, result of the gene therapy trial, uh, you, you can imagine that it, it you know, paused all gene therapy research for, for many, many years. And it's not really until just in the last couple of years that we have some good news with respect to gene therapy. So, and that's what we're going to start talking about. So, so unfortunately, Jesse um, passed away because of this failed trial. It set back gene therapy research, you know, as it should have uh, for, for many years. And scientists and doctors think they found a way to prevent something like this or minimize a, a tragic, tragic scenario like this from occurring again. So let's see what they're doing now. So one of the most promising stories with respect to gene therapy comes from trials to treat a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. And we'll talk more about this, this genetic disorder soon, but essentially it, it's lethal shortly after birth for the most severe cases. And the gene therapy approach to treating this is based on a virus called AAV or a family of viruses called AAV. Now, this is a deno associated virus. Well, that's what this stands for, a deno associated virus. And in this video, essentially what we're gonna do is cover the background essential biology we need to understand about this virus to understand how the gene therapy uh, approach to treating this disorder works. So, AAV is what we would call, or this family of viruses, is what we would call a, a um, icosahedral viruses. So these viruses are icosahedral viruses. And what that means is they have a capsid, I'll explain what a capsid is in a second, that looks something like this. Let's see if I can diagram this to make it look something like an icosahedron. I think that does. That's not too bad. I watched a couple of videos of some artists making some beautiful icosahedrons using, uh, I forget that, that, that tool that helps you draw circles. That was pretty neat. Um, but we don't have time for that. But okay, so this is an icosahedron. And an icosahedron essentially is a shape made up of 20 equilateral triangles. And okay, you fit those together and make this sort of spherical isosahedron. And AAV viruses are, they're really small. They're some of the smallest viruses known 
viruses that have a capsid, and the capsid is sort of the protein shell that encases the genetic material of the virus, and the capsid is about 20 nanometers in diameter. And AAV viruses have genomes that are 4,700 nucleotides long. And this is nuts, right? So, so DNA with two strands is about two nanometers wide. And so the genome is DNA-based. It's single-stranded DNA-based. So and that's a good thing because that's a lot of DNA. You know, 4,700 base pairs would be kind of hard to squeeze into a, a 22 nanometer diameter volume, I think it would be. So, so you can imagine that this DNA is pretty packed in there. And again, it's single-stranded, and there are going to be some hairpin regions in this DNA, which we'll see in a moment. So 22 nanometer diameter volume, 4,700 nucleotide long single-stranded DNA genome stuffed into that capsid. And that's the, the general AAV uh, virus. So this family of virus is characterized by serotypes. And so what's a serotype? Well, essentially serotypes uh, of AAV result because different forms of AAV are recognized by different antibodies and they're recognized by different antibodies because they have, uh, you know, the proteins have slightly different structures and there might be different proteins on the, on the capsid. Um, as a result, they have different antigens. Antibodies are the, the uh, recognized antigens. So AAV2, AAV3, these are all different forms of AAVs. So they all have AAV9, and there are scientists who are characterizing, looking through, through various animals for all different types of AAVs, because AAVs seem to be really good viruses to use in gene therapy. So we have these different serotypes here. And again, the different serotypes exist because, you know, slightly different structures or different sequences of the capsids uh, are going to result in different antibodies recognizing the different types of AAV. So let's say we have a human here who's been infected with AAV2, and then we have another human over here who's been infected with AAV9. Now this individual here will make antibodies that recognize or that detect AAV2. Not right away, you know, after the infection, antibodies will eventually develop, and now this individual will make antibodies towards AAV2. But not AAV9, because this individual hasn't been exposed to AAV9. This individual over here, we will say, is seropositive for AAV2. AAV9, same thing. So AAV9 will make antibodies that recognize the antigens on AAV9. This individual, after the infection, after the, his or her immune system has had time to develop antibodies for AAV9, will be seropositive for AAV9. This individual has antibodies that recognize AAV9. So that's, you know, uh, we can relate this to, to current, um, I guess what's going on right now, right, with the COVID pandemic. One of my questions and many question, uh, many scientists have the same question, is like how many of us, so what percentage of our population is seropositive for COVID-19? You know, how many of us have already been exposed to the virus? We don't know it. You know, we, we were never sick. We never really showed any symptoms, but we've already been exposed and we already have antibodies towards it. So there's a lot of talk about restarting the economy and, and um, loosening social distance, distancing rules. This is probably gonna play a big role in how quickly those rules are eased and how quickly the economy is, is um, opened up again. So, okay, back to the AAV story. 
So, oh yeah, another thing. So AAV viruses, even though they're widespread in our population, 80% of humans are seropositive for AAV2, we've never seen a disorder. We've never seen, uh, not a disorder, a, a disease or illness resulting from AAV2 infection. So most of us have this virus, but we're not sick. We're not sick. Or we've had the virus in the past and, and we've had no symptoms. So, so this is really interesting to me, the fact that, that um, organisms can have viruses and you know be symptomless. That's pretty neat. So some advanced thing that we won't really get to is already being exposed to, let's say AAV2 would prevent a doctor from using AAV2 to as a gene therapy tool, say to treat to, uh, um, to treat a genetic disorder that you might have. So so this is important, and that's why there are a lot of scientists looking for AAVs out there in our population, uh, or even other animals looking for AAV type viruses that that aren't prevalent in the human population. Because if you're going to use an AAV modified AAV, modified adeno-associated virus in gene therapy, you don't want your patients to already have antibodies to that virus. That's an advanced note that we don't need to really worry about for, for this course. So what else do we want to talk about general AAV biology? Okay, yes. So we need to talk about the AAV genome. So as I already said, about 4,700 nucleotides long because it is single-stranded DNA. And it is characterized by these things called inverted terminal repeats. And they're going to look something like this. So there's one. And then we have, these are hydrogen bonds. So this is intramolecular hydrogen bonding. This is the three prime end and that's the five prime end there. And we have this repeat here, okay. And um, so what this means, we're gonna invert this and we're also gonna put it on the other end over here. Okay, so we have our inverted terminal repeats, one on each end of the single-stranded DNA viral genome. And then these are on either end of a single-stranded DNA that has two genes called rep and cap. Now, Due to multiple start sites, plus one sites for transcription, and alternate splicing, REP makes four transcripts, or I should say four mRNA variants, equals four proteins. So this gene right here encodes four different proteins. They're called, uh, let me see, I have the numbers written here somewhere, Rep78, Rep68, Rep52, Rep and Rep40. And while you know we have this these name, Rep, while these may help with replication of the virus, the virus doesn't have a polymerase. So it uses a host uh, uses a uh, uh, yeah the host cell uh, DNA polymerase from the host cell to replicate the genome, probably with help from these proteins. In cap, due to alternate splicing, makes two mRNA variants, and we get three proteins because there's an alternate translation start site in one of those messenger RNAs. 
So one of those messenger RNAs, when it is translated, can make one or the other protein, encodes one or the other protein. So those proteins are called VP1, VP2, and VP3. And these are the capsid proteins. So these work together to make that icosahedral capsid. Okay, so one more thing on AAV biology. So now that we know what the genome looks like, what the capsid looks like, we can talk about how infection works or transduction. Now transduction is a fancy genetics term for how foreign DNA is inserted into cell by a virus. And we saw this way back when we were talking about um, bacterial genetics, which I think was in lecture nine. I'll take that back. I don't know if we actually talked about that then. When did we talk about transduction? Um, we may not have talked about it yet. We're talking about it now. Okay, we're talking about it now. So, okay, so transduction, how does AAV get its viral, its genome into a host cell? Essentially, there's a lot of this process that is not well understood, which blows my mind, right? Because we're using AAV in gene therapy, but we don't really know the details of, you know, how it seems to be working, but we don't really know all the steps of why it's working. So this isn't just me who just doesn't know it. The people who are actually spending their lives studying this virus, they don't understand everything about it. And, you know, it's being used in gene therapy and, you know, seems to be working. So I guess, you know, if it's working, why not use it and then figure out why it works later? I guess that's one approach, right? Okay, so these are cell receptors on the membrane, let's say, of a, of a random human cell. So AAV binds to the receptors. It's dragged into the cytoplasm by endocytosis and somehow released from a, a endocy endocytotic, is that how you say it? Vesicle? endocytotic vesicle into the cytoplasm. And somehow the virus is then going to be exported from the capsid or released from the capsid, brought to the nucleus, And this is where it gets very confusing and a lot is unknown. So it's a single-stranded DNA, right? In order to be transcribed, somehow this has to be double-stranded first. Made double-stranded. Because RNA polymerase binds double-stranded DNA, right? And transcribes from double-stranded DNA. And at this point, it can be used in transcription to make viral mRNAs, those viral mRNAs we talked about before, and those can be exported to the cytoplasm where they can be translated to make the viral proteins. There's the ribosome, there's a protein, and those proteins can go back in and you know help with, with the viral DNA replication. So, so, two, so there are two possible things that can happen or two possible pathways that a virus can follow after infection of a cell. So uh, the lytic pathway is one of them and the lys uh, lysogenic 
we call it lysogenic pathway. Lysogenic pathway is another. In the lytic pathway, now for AAV to enter the lytic pathway, AAV needs a helper virus, like an adenovirus. So this is adeno-associated virus. It needs something else has to be there in order for it to enter the lytic pathway. And what happens during the lytic pathway? Lots of viruses made. So lots of viral genomes are replicated. Lots of the captive proteins are made. Lots of virions. So that a virion would be the whole thing, the capsid plus the DNA. Lots of virions are made in the cell you know, bursts and the viruses are released and all the nearby cells can, can be infected. Now, if it's released into the bloodstream, well, it can be carried to, to very far from the infected cell after it bursts. So the lysogenic pathway is sort of a hibernation hibernation state. And this happens in the absence of a helper virus. Now, one of the peculiar things about AAV in the hibernation state, it tends to insert in the human genome at a specific location, which has been designated AAVS1. And this is found on chromosome 19. So it's very peculiar and scientists don't really understand why this happens, but it requires the ITRs, REP78 and REP68 proteins. So two of those four REP proteins are required for inserting at this location in a human cell, in the human genome. It doesn't necessarily have to insert into the genome either. It can also uh, um, lay dormant in other and we're going to see this in a moment, in circular DNA molecules, probably in the nucleus. And we're going to see this in a, in a moment. So other forms, other DNA forms, hibernation in other DNA forms is possible. So in the genome or in other forms is possible in the lysogenic pathway. Okay, so, so that's it for the background on AAV biology. In the next video, we'll take a look at how AAV, or a, one of the AAVs, is being used in gene therapy. Okay, see you in the next video.